Hello, hello, hello. This is attorney Mike Gravel coming to you from Chicago as usual. Ah, I thought I, I, I was really proud of myself. I, I did a video today and I, I, I put it out early. It was fantastic, by the way. It was fantastic out in Washington, apparently. <laughs> And I, okay, because I have a lot of stuff to do today. I'm like, I'm good for the day. And then and then I see this, and I've been meaning to get into this case. I'm going to admit to you right now, I don't know much about this case. We're going to learn about it together. But the defense filed some some motions. I, I, when I say I don't know much about this case, I, I, you, you scratch the surface of this thing, there is just everything going on. Absolutely everything. <laughs> So I'm just going to to let let the defense the, the defense files motions they're approaching trial and I'm just and I'm just going to run it and I think I may or may not have some guests joining me uh but you know either way it's going to be it's going to be all good let's get it started Going on the record in this matter, this is case CR 22211624, State versus Lori Noreen Vallo. This is the time scheduled for a hearing on motions that are pending filed by the defense. Uh, what remains then for the uh, court today are two motions as they relate to the charges that are contained in the indictment. Two separate motions, one as it relates to aggravating factors um, and the other motion as it relates to counts one and three with the conspiracy charges. Uh, we'll hear argument on those motions. I will indicate one other procedural matter that uh, upon completion of this hearing, the audience will be instructed by the security here in the bailiffs as to uh, when you'll be leaving the courtroom for security purposes, so please remain seated until you're instructed to uh, leave the courtroom upon the conclusion of this hearing. So going forward to the motions now, let me first just ask Mr. Thomas, is the defense ready to proceed with your motions? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And is the state ready to proceed this morning, Mr. Wood? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. First motion I'd like to take up then is the Okay, I have to admit that this is new to me. That uh, truly, my exposure to this prior has been um, watching Kurt over at Uncivil Law read um, fiction from Chad Daybell, and it was fantastic. It, it really was. I, I didn't even know what Lori Daybell looked like, but there's there she is. Um, they're narrowing. They're, they're trying to narrow issues. Uh, these are pretrial motions from the defense as we approach trial. Motion that was filed on July twelfth entitled motion to remand a grand jury for probable cause determination as to alleged aggravating factors. Why don't we start there, Mr. Thomas. I've reviewed your motion and briefing. I've reviewed the state's response as well. And if you'd like to present argument on that at this time, you may. Kurt. What's up? How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. How are you, sir? Give us a 10 second, uh, 30 second background on this. I know it's that that's a that's a tall order. That's a tall order. Well, the, the, the short version is that Laurie Vallow murdered her her kid mm -hmm. and um, and Chad Daybell helped. The more complicated version is they're part of a cult conspiracy, apocalyptic, end of days, survivalist, Mormon. Yeah. Club I got that from Court TV today. I used it for my thumbnail. Murders, the, the Doomsday murders, Day Bells. Murders, murders of spouses, attempted assassination of witnesses. And yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a complex, it's it's the it's one of the cases I'm definitely following. And it's the case I have the least factual understanding of. Because it's such yep. a complete nightmare. Yeah, there's just so much going on. So I didn't pick up. I did. I did our, our already um, talk about your stream where you did Chad Daybell's. Uh, you did a dramatic reading of Chad Daybell's fiction. It was great. It was fantastic. It was, it was one of my favorite YouTube moments. <laughs> it was glorious. <laughs> it really was. All right. All right. Let's get back to. It. I think John might come join us too. All right. Well, let's 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 get to it. Certainly, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, we would also, uh, we, we have filed a uh, motion to incorporate federal and state constitutional grounds in support of future motions and objections. That has not yet been heard. So I would just like to put that on the record that we are relying upon. 
I, I think that's a really weird motion. It doesn't really matter. I'm not going to stop this every two seconds, but you, you want to make a motion to incorporate the Constitution. It's in there. It's it's in everything we do at all times. You don't need, you don't need to incorporate it. I'd like the court to take judicial notice that the Constitution exists. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we're in the United States, and and that 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 uh, rules overall. Mm-hmm. Yes, fair enough. Uh, uh, that motion, and uh, and we're relying upon the fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth, and fourteenth amendments of the United States Constitution. Um, there Not are about her. seventy cases that are cited in that motion. Um, I can read those off for the clerk or for Please the uh, reporter if the court is okay with that, or would the court like me to? Is well, we don't, acknowledging? Have, we don't have that notice for hearing today, Mr. Thomas. I mean, I can take note that it's been filed and understand the uh, request you're making there in terms of making any specific finding or determination. Right. It, it's not set for hearing. Uh, the motion's been lodged in the case, and I don't think it's necessary to put all the authority into the record on the oral motion at this time unless you think that's necessary so it's up to you and i don't think it's necessary i just want to make sure uh for appeal purposes that the court is aware that we are relying upon those uh uh, constitutional amendments okay and i do understand that those are (laughs) incorporated into your uh, defense here and we'll be considering those federal constitutional protections as well in this case thank you your honor uh so the first uh motion that we're going to argue today is the uh with regards to the uh, aggravating factors, Your Honor. We believe that um, uh, that there should be a probable cause uh, hearing on these aggravating factors. Uh, pursuant to our motion, we indicated that uh, those aggravating factors uh, enhance, uh, if you will, the penalty, uh, and therefore they are part of uh, of of the punishment here. We understand the state's position, and we understand that the state's position, the, the Supreme Court of the uh, state of Idaho's position, is that Abdullah is uh, controlling law here. And we, we get that, but uh, we are of the um, opinion that, uh, that there should be uh, probable cause uh, hearings on each of these aggravators uh, for several reasons, one being uh, that it narrows down uh, the possibility of us uh, having to uh, prepare for a trial on a on an aggravating factor that that doesn't fit that doesn't meet the probable cause standard. Uh, th- there are other reasons that we've noted in our brief. We'd ask the court to uh, consider those. Uh, as- All right, I'm I'm not going to put- in view of controlling legal authority. Yeah, I, I I don't want to put you guys on the spot. I don't know Abdullah. I'm not familiar with it. He's saying he wants probable cause hearings for every charge. For every aggravating factor. Oh yeah, excuse me. For every aggravating ca- factor. I mean, I just don't do criminal. I don't. I don't know if that makes sense or not. It doesn't appear to in this context. No, it absolutely really. makes no sense, makes sense at all. Either because the the <laughs> aggravating factors will ultimately have to be found by the jury, but they're aggravating factors. The the underlying charge is all that you need to charge, right? Whether right. or not you're able, whether or not you're ever able to prove the aggravating factors or not. The charge is the charge yeah. itself is valid, so it's like yeah. why do it's I need a, probable it's a cause? It's sensing question. Yeah, why do why do I need probable cause for the the sensing factors in order at this time? It's like well, yeah. I don't because maybe I'll never be able to prove them at all. Oh well, the, the, the trial's still valid. Yeah, that's that's my gut reaction. But like I'm like the, you know since I don't do it, I'm like ah, there might be things I don't know. You, you know that doesn't sounds it sounds dumb to me. Like, yeah, yeah and, I, and kick I, me I off with cause for the actual charge. Let's get convicted it, it, on that. Cer- it right. certainly in no way makes the trial more efficient. No, it doesn't. I, when you're and the aggravating to put factors the are before the horse, sentencing anyway. So why are we mentioning them now? Yep, we're putting the cart before the horse. Yeah, I mean, we may not yeah, even you... know the necessary. We may not even know the aggravating factors. It's possible, albeit somewhat unlikely, but it's possible that someone will give testimony during the trial itself that will. Illuminate new and exciting aggravating factors. <laughs> I, I I think that I think that might actually be Chad Daybell's um, fiction. Yeah. <laughs> okay. no, I, I, I think it may be improbable because it's I more probable here than like charge all the this aggravating is, factors. This is such a factual yes. cluster. God knows what the testimony is actually yeah. going to be at trial at this point. Is what I'm thinking. 
Yeah, either either way, you got to prove the elements of the offense or not. That's it. That's what the trial is. Yes. Earlier, right. we understand that Abdullah is the uh, law of the land here in Idaho, but as the court is well aware, especially uh, this year, uh, where the Supreme Court uh, ruled uh, to overturn Roe versus Wade. Roe versus uh -huh. Wade was the okay. law of the land for a number of years, uh, and then uh, through what? time and change, uh, they decided to overturn that. Uh, that was a landmark case, and uh, we would just like to, uh, for oh, appeal purposes, oh, well, put that on the record Bob? that we believe that, 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 that argument uh, it I've should be a problem. Yeah, he's hurting me already. He he kicks it off with, "Hey, the Constitution exists," and then and then he moves on to sometimes the Supreme Court changes its mind. Bo both things the court's well aware of. <laughs> and 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 the, and the trial as the trial court, what do you want me to do about it? Even exactly. If I, even if I a hundred percent agree with you, what am I supposed to do about it? And At all. And implicit in that is, I know that my position's wrong because I'm arguing for a change of law. Yeah. So I, I, you're telling the judge if if you agree with me right now, you're already wrong. Right. But I have no yeah, choice. Your because, I have no choice is pretty be high because I'm bound by the law as it yeah. currently exists. So I will cause a standard as far as these uh, these aggravating factors go, and we would uh, rely upon that. Uh, for appeal purposes. We understand that the court is likely to uh, deny uh, our motion on that, but we would like that uh, to be part of the record. And that's all, that's all we have on that. All right, I have a question then, Mr. Thomas. If under your motion, who would make a probable cause determination? Are you suggesting, because this case came about as a result of a grand jury indictment, are you suggesting it would need to go back through another grand jury indictment? Or Oh, good Lord. I don't even deal with this, but the, the, the judge asked a very good question there. Who, who's going to – if we were to do this, this came in through a grand jury indictment on a true yeah. bill. What do you what – how? what's the procedure then that you're proposing, you know? Go through some sort of a hearing similar to a preliminary hearing where a magistrate potentially or me would determine probable cause. You know, that would be a hybrid issue, and I don't think that that, that would be appropriate. I think that it should go back to the grand jury. Uh, to have them uh, to decide whether or not this should move forward. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure that the Idaho uh, statutes and constitution allow for that hybrid, uh, bring it back to a grand jury or bring it back to a preliminary hearing and let some uh, a magistrate or, or your honor uh, to decide whether those are probable cause or not. I'm not sure that it would really matter, but uh, I would think that uh, bringing it back to a grand jury would be the more appropriate way to do it Wait, since they were the ones who found uh, the Which one is it? Cause is, is it, is it the, constitutionally uh, alleged or does crimes? It really matter? Uh, I, I would why. ask that the court. Oh, good God! I I don't even Did know this how you would do law that. Pick, pick one. Pick one of the two. It's, it's constitutionally <laughs> infirm, impossible. I don't believe the Constitution allows for it. Also, it doesn't matter, Your Honor. Uh, yeah. You you don't you don't get to. It, it's not a buffet. You request <laughs> your relief. <laughs> Yeah, and then and then what? You just keep going back to a grand jury until until you get the 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 result you want, which you're not going to, by the way. The grand jury is going to do the same thing. Oh or, uh, my God, I, I require don't, that they also find uh, probable cause upon the aggravating factors. All right, thanks for the response to the question, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Wood, what is the state's response on the motion for uh, further probable cause determination on aggravating factors? Your Honor, I'll be brief. Uh, th th this guy, I watched a little bit of this. I was doing other stuff, but I watched a little bit of this. Th this guy makes a lot of sense, but he's got the better argument, plain and simple. It would be hard not to. <laughs> Mr. Thomas has pointed out there is controlling law on this issue, uh, directly on this issue in State versus Abdullah. It's a 2015 case, capital case, where the death penalty was found. Um, and I'll just... Uh, this is in my brief, but I'll just read from it very quickly. This is a direct quote from that case. We also hold that there is no constitutional requirement that the state present evidence demonstrating probable cause for each aggravating circumstance to properly notify the defendant of its intent to seek the death penalty. That sounds pretty and so, clear. Uh, as Mr. Thomas just stated, uh, that is controlling that uh, the Supreme Court of the state of Idaho. <laughs> that analysis starts, uh, their analysis starts with a discussion of Ring versus Arizona, which is the case that found that death penalty needs to be found by a jury. Um, yeah. Okay. We got. I've got three attorneys in here. How often do you get a case that on point that, that, that suits often. your needs? Not that often. 
I mean, literally, yeah, Supreme yeah. Court case that says you win. I'll leave the website if I'm done. Goodbye. Almost never, unless the other side hasn't done their job. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, that case has been interpreted by some to to uh, provide that there should be a probable cause finding of aggravating factors, even though the Supreme Court did not actually find that. Uh, Abdullah okay, goes through that, that analysis um, and come to the conclusion that I just, the, the Supreme Court comes to the conclusion I just read. Uh, where the Supreme Court has found that, where it's uh, directly on point, uh, I think this decision is already made for the court. I understand Mr. Thomas's yes, argument, but it's for exactly the purposes, it. and we, we yeah. understand that. More work than um, but as for this case, and under the current law, uh, this is an issue that's already decided by the Supreme Court. Uh, there's no need for probable cause to be found of the aggravating factors. Um, Idaho law determines how uh, those aggravating factors are listed and how that notice of intent is given. Uh, and that has been upheld in Abdullah. And so uh, for today, uh, I, I think Mr. Thomas said it well, for purposes of appeal, they've, they've raised the issue. But as of uh, for this case today, I think this decision's already been made by the Supreme Court. All right, thank you for the response, Mr. Wood. Mr. Thomas, do you have any rebuttal argument to make? No, Your Honor. That was way too many words. The court's the considered argument. the motion then at this time, uh, given the nature of the case and love making a finding or ruling from the bench. The court will take this matter under advisement and will issue a written decision on the motion. That will be lodged once we've completed the research and written the decision on that. So that. Yeah, that, and that decision will be motion denied. Uh, that means you lose. <laughs> yeah. First motion will be taken under advisement. Right. Mr. Thomas, then if you'd like to present argument on the second motion. And that was your motion filed also January, I'm sorry, July 12th uh, to remand the indictment to the grand jury for further proceedings uh, and in particular stating your objections to the listing of the offenses in counts one and three of the indictment. If you'd like to present your argument on that motion at this time, you may. Now, Thank you, Your Honor. better argument in writing. Um, our, our main argument uh, revolves around, around counts one and three. Uh, that they're uh, confusing to the jury. Uh, they would be confusing to a jury uh, when they have to find this uh, after after the trial uh, to find this uh, the, these these elements. And the, the I see that the state is uh, saying that the crimes of uh, murder and the crime of of grand theft are not necessarily the crimes in the conspiracy. Uh, however, this doesn't make any sense uh, because the conspiracy to commit murder and the conspiracy to commit grand theft are two separate conspiracies uh, and I'll go through that uh, in, in just a bit but we do believe that, that it would be confusing to a jury uh, to be able to uh, figure out what elements were met and when the elements were met and to what extent the elements were met. Uh, the burden is high, the burden is uh, beyond a reasonable doubt if they meet some of the burden uh, at, a, at a different standard, uh, perhaps a probable cause standard, or perhaps a, a more likely than not, or a uh, or a different standard, uh, that would be that would be severely detrimental to our client. So I think one of the um, things that we need to think about in, in reviewing whether or not these uh, these charges, conspiracy to commit murder and, and grand theft in counts one and counts three should be split off or bifurcated. Uh, I think we need to say when, when does the conspiracy end? Well, one would think that the conspiracy to commit murder would end when the alleged murder occurs. That would be the end of the conspiracy. Okay, Kurt, here's where I need you. Uh, John, you were, you were like, I, I got to look all this stuff up and know I'm like, we don't have that kind of time. We're, we're just rolling. But wh why is he into all these inchoate offenses on conspiracy? I mean, we've got We've got actual crimes that occurred. Are, are these just? Is this just multiple counts? I, I don't have. I don't know what's been charged. So in Idaho, I actually did have that in front of me. Um, I can tell you what the charge <laughs> in this case. Impressive. I did, I did some research. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to come on here unprepared. Uh, give me one <laughs> second. I had to sign up for an account and everything. Um, <laughs> 
If you give me two seconds, I will have that for you. It is nine counts. Um, oh. It is uh, one second because obviously internet's not playing nicely with me. Uh, criminal conspiracy, murder one, criminal conspiracy, murder one, criminal, uh, murder one, co conspiracy, murder one, and two counts of insurance fraud. Okay, so they, they're, they're doing both. I, I get it as a, pro, as a former prosecutor. They're charging it, and then they're charging these inchoate offenses because they really don't know how it, how it all went down. So as they get the, as they get the facts in, they can, they can like throw them, they, they can, they can fit to what whatever the proofs are. So you want you want a fallback charge. I mean, why wouldn't you charge I, both if you can? I would. I, I, yeah. I think so. I think that this is a lot of the reason why, from a just moral standpoint, I don't really like lesser included. But right. if you can do it, do it. Well, th thank you. I mean, that I, I'm actually duly impressed. When you said that, I'm like, no, I have to put the stream together. I can't do that. But you, you actually did look this up, and it helped a lot right here. Thank you. And also, thank you for the overview, Mr. Kurt. And uh, thank you, uh, Runkle, when you, when you show up. <laughs> he hasn't he hasn't quite oh, quite. I'm, uh, I'm, he's in he's in he's in Kohate. Oh, oh, you're 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 here, I'm, Ian. I'm here. Yep. I'm just uh, I'm driving. In the town of Earth Creek, which is a really small um, reserve community, uh, just just had a court appearance at the court uh, courthouse out here, and thought I'd pop on, but uh, I probably oh, don't have awesome. enough uh, signal to do video. Yeah, I, I got it. That, I that makes don't have sense. To do video, and and the angle would not be great because uh, yeah, yeah. So all right, yeah, have have you, have you been watch? Have you been following the Staybell case at all? Ian? A little bit. I think it's kind of interesting how you guys do the lesser and included because in Canada, they're always sort of part of the uh, part of what you have to, you know, consider. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, we, 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 lo we lost him a little bit. All right. Well, well let's carry on here. Um, the state has pled in count two uh, of the indictment that the murder of Tyler Ryan occurred on or between September 8th and September 9th. So that would be the end of that conspiracy. Um, the conspiracy to cr commit the crime uh, would have been completed and the conspiracy to the murder would have been over. Uh, one would think that the conspiracy to commit grand theft ended when the grand theft... I don't think that's necessarily true. This is I, just an awesome the principal object of the conspiracy to be sure, but if you're, if you're doing things after the murder, like hiding evidence, concealing things, that extends the conspiracy. Yes, and it's such a legalized argument, too. Like, I mean, you're you're saying, hey, my, my, you know, we don't we, we should get rid of these inchoate defenses because once once um, the murders occurred, which was likely performed by his client, <laughs> then 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 the, the conspiracy, I mean, it's very technical and it, and it just puts your client in a horrible light. I get well, it. it. Isn't the whole argument that then it has to be that the defense you're arguing is that, yes, they murdered the person and that's yeah. why they shouldn't get conspiracy for any evidence after the fact? Like, isn't that a really dumb yeah, argument? <laughs> You can have acts well after the, the conspiracy that continue the conspiracy. Although statute of limitations is not a problem, obviously, in a murder case. Yep. If you had a case where statute of limitations was a problem, if you have actions that occur after the statute of limitations expires that extends the conspiracy, well, it extends the conspiracy. So the statute of limitations now is still running. So you could, if you have a statute of limitations at five years, for example, and 10 years after the fact, you have some ele some thing that is furthering the conspiracy, hiding evidence, destroying evidence, whatever. Like that yep. statute of limitations goes bye bye. So like, you're right, okay, or, or just happened, destroying evidence the right there, even, even without a statute. You're right, just destroying evidence it, it, it right. will get you there. Right, because now, yeah. So obviously that's not a problem. But I'm just pointing out that like even in a, a case where you have statute of limitations, statute of limitations is five years, twenty years after the fact. You're doing things in furtherance. Guess what? Statute is now 
now not no longer Reset. a problem. So yeah, the idea, well, we committed the murder, that ends the conspiracy for the murder. I'm like, I don't think so, Tim. Not not I, I don't I, think so. I I don't I don't know this guy and I I don't wanna speak ill of fellow attorney, but I think that he has all of his arguments <laughs> backwards. And yeah. I there's no other way I can say that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I wonder if, I wonder if he's appointed or if they hired him. That's a, that, that'll be interesting too. We, we shall see. I, I don't know. Does this? You think this thing actually goes to trial, or you, th- you think we have some plea deal? Oh, it's going to trial. There's no doubt it's, in my mind. Uh, it's scheduled for trial. If you want the date, I can pull that one. Yeah. I don't think um, the state. I don't think the state's going to plead. I think they're going all the way. Two seconds. Jury trial January 9th, 2023. Yeah. They better not date. plead. I'm covering it. I'm yeah. gaveling to gaveling this shit. I'm depending yep. on it for my channel growth. They better not settle. <laughs> hey, Kurt, if you ever <laughs> want to invite me on, we need I'd material, love to man, on that. Man. Theft was over. Uh, and the pleadings in count seven uh, of the indictment indicate that the grand theft would have occurred after the murder. The murder of Tyler Ryan was pled to have, to have allegedly occurred uh, no later than September 9th, and the murder of J.J. Vallow uh, in count three, that murder would have uh, was alleged to have been committed uh, on, on or before uh, September 23rd. And so the grand theft uh, was alleged to have occurred pursuant to their indictment between October 1st and January 22nd. So the conspiracy while we can have a, a before portion of the conspiracy, October 1, 2019, and January 22nd, 2020. Oh, thank you. And so they're saying that uh, oh, wait, the conspiracy, uh, while it could have possibly uh, honor about developed. Like every other lawyer on the face of the earth uses. When yeah. they say honor between these days, as opposed to honor about these days. Who writes yeah, honor that's... between? <laughs> No, it has to be on or about. Yeah, I yeah, but well, you, I don't know. If, if if you're doing in between, you got to set two times. You, you know, that's why we use on or about. Developed <laughs> earlier, uh, it could not possibly have ended in the same time that the conspiracy to commit murder would have ended. So the conspiracy to commit murder would have ended at the very least, at the very most, on September 23rd. The conspiracy yeah. to uh, commit the grand theft. The grand thefts were committed between October 1st, allegedly, and, and January 22nd uh, of the following year. Do we know what the grand thefts are? Again, I don't mean to put you in there, but I, I don't know. That's the insurance fraud, isn't it? I believe that's the insurance fraud. And so those don't line up. Well, Mr. So, Mr. Thomas, though, can't you have an ongoing conspiracy of different offenses? I mean, a classic conspiracy you, is like a drug conspiracy <laughs> where somebody's... Thank you doing a delivery of a controlled substance and then a week later another delivery and a week later another delivery and that's all part of a grand conspiracy charge that would have multiple offenses is not the time frame open through all of these charged offenses sort of but not not after the conspiracy to commit murder once the conspiracy to, once the murder is committed there is no conspiracy to commit the murder there's maybe uh-huh. a cover up or or a, a conspiracy to uh uh I don't know. After the fact, some sort of a uh, some sort of other other charge. But once the conspiracy to commit murder, once the murder is over, the conspiracy is over, right? Yeah. I don't I don't see how that could go go anywhere further. And so with the with the uh, the conspiracy to commit murder over, I think that's where that charge ends. The conspiracy to commit murder ends at the end of the murder. And so I don't think that they can tag on. A conspiracy to commit grand theft as part of the conspiracy to commit murder and and in fact the state uh, says that in their brief they say that Idaho code 18 1701 gives the punishment for conspiracy yes, I pulled it up. as punishable upon the con- That's not Wait, punishment. What? it's 18 1701 is the charge of conspiracy and it's not the punishment phase so he's even wrong about that <laughs> I did that literally while we were listening to it. Two yes, ago. midstream, you 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 figured this out. It's eighteen forty one oh seven, which is the punishment. Seventeen oh one is the charge. 
in the same right. manner and in the same extent as provided under the laws of the state of Idaho for the punishment of the crime or offense to which the combined had committed. And in, in layman's terms, I think, if I'm reading it correctly, and I may not be, but it says in, in layman's terms, this is what I feel, that uh, if they find a conspiracy to commit murder, then the punishment is death. And that is the conspiracy to commit, th that's the conspiracy. If the conspiracy to commit grand theft, well, the yeah, punishment not, would be up to 14 years in prison. Mean, um, and so it sounds like there are two possible punishments to this one conspiracy, uh, either death or life in prison or 14 years in prison. And so to me, it sounds like there are two conspiracies. I understand the state's, uh, uh, the state's position where they say the conspiracy is the crime, not the murder and not the grand theft. But when you, right. when you make a statement like that, you have to back it up with the facts that say, well, yeah, once they've committed the conspiracy, we have to now go to the punishment. And their punishment doesn't meet the crime. The what? conspiracy punishment what? is one of two or three different punishments, either death, life in prison, or, or, or 14 years. What's so it could be possible for this one jury to find like some elements of the grand theft, some elements of the, uh, of the murder, and say, eh, maybe they met all, maybe they met all, the, uh, all the elements. We're not asking the court to, uh, you, you know, I, I, I did uh, ask the court to strike the pleadings, uh, but that was mostly in, in alternatives. Our, our main issue is we don't want to have to do this again. We don't want to have to come back, back before the court after the trial's over and it goes up on appeal and the appeal court says we couldn't make heads or tails of what was going on with this conspiracy uh, charge. And so we think that it's just easier for the court to say, you know what, bring it back to the grand jury, have them split it off, have them do one conspiracy to commit murder, one conspiracy to commit grand theft. It's just that easy and therefore it doesn't, it, it brings the jury into a position of we plead, we, we find them either guilty or not guilty, not, well, guilty of the grand theft, but not of the murder, and it just, it just makes it so that there's too many questions for the jury. Um, not, I'm not saying that the jury isn't sophisticated enough to, to sort through that, but I've been practicing. Yeah, yes, you are. Yeah, that's exactly what you're saying. All and right. that's okay. He, he, he's saying that, that, that you can do it another way, but I, I, I'm, I'm unconvinced. Let's, let me just. None of this makes any sense. The reason it doesn't make any sense is because conspiracy is a completely separate charge from the act itself. So conspiracy to commit murder is a completely different independent charge from murder. It's not a lesser included. The reason you know that it's not is because it doesn't... You don't both have to actually accomplish an element the, act. the other. That's the way, reason you know. right? Mm -hmm. In order to have a conspiracy, you need to have an agreement to do with something and an overact towards it. And that can be a lot of different things. But in order to have a murder, you know, someone needs to die. Uh -huh. And you don't necessarily and you don't necessarily need, of course, the agreement to have the murder. Right? You can right. have accessory without necessarily having agreement. So that's what makes them distinct. So they are completely separate criminal charges. Okay, that means the jury can find you guilty of the conspiracy, but not the murder, or could find you guilty of the murder, but not the conspiracy, or Guilty of both, not guilty of both. Fine. Then, if we find you guilty of the conspiracy, the charge, the, the penalty for the conspiracy, it would be the same as the underlying offense. In this case, murder. All right. Fine. So we have three possible sanctions under the statute: death, life, or fourteen years. Now, without an actual death, if it's just conspiracy by itself, right, the death penalty is out because the Supreme Court has told us that in order to have the death penalty, we need to have a death occur. And we, we're in this hypothetical, we're assuming we're not convicting a murder. We're just convicting of the conspiracy. All right. So that would mean the death penalty is out. So now we're left with life imprisonment or 14 years. Okay. So life imprisonment or 14 years. Fine. What's the problem? Yep. Let's the go figure out which of those two other is we're the other we'll have a charges. Hearing and figure out if it's life or if it's 14 years. I no, found you not guilty of the murder. I found you guilty of the conspiracy. I can't do the death penalty. Mm -hmm. So I have two options left. Let's go figure out which one. And the problem is... I don't even know if the jury right? does that. The, the yeah. sentencing may be okay. the judge. So, I mean, it just depends on their statutory scheme. I don't. I just don't know off yeah. the top of my head. 
Right. So I don't well, understand the problem. No, so I mean, the you, there isn't you, can one. Go, you can go a step further with that in, you know, conspiracy to rob a bank and that becomes a predicate for felony murder. I mean, I think you spent a little much time doing bar exam hypotheticals, but as a practical matter, the issue is they have eight other charges and I think they're trying to lay a predicate for concurrent as opposed to whatever comes out being essentially a death sentence. So if you can do the 14 years twice, maybe she won't be dead at the end of the term. I, I'm wondering if that's how he's trying to do it. He seems really incompetent and really bad at formulating his position, but I could see in my mind's eye trying to argue against like an ineffective <laughs> assistance argument. I could see why you would make the arguments amongst those. This is just a really, it is a really tough case. Yeah. Yeah. Law for 20 years and this particular uh, charge baffled me and I, I had to work through it and, and I still am having issues working through it. And this is what I do for a living. So yeah, it, it just <laughs> makes it uh, all the more difficult. Um, so uh, th another point, Your Honor, is that this is just fundamentally unfair. Um, the state no. argues in, in line five of their jury instructions. It actually doesn't exist in criminal uh, law. Says, right. further, the explicit language by establishing that the state needs to prove that the defendant intended that at least one of the crimes would be committed. They emphasize the words at least one of the crimes. So in, in my mind, that infers that the defendant need not complete, need not even contemplate the commission of the murder, only the grand theft, or vice versa, only the grand theft and not the murder. And so, so I, I have issue with the state saying, hey, we can lump all of these things into one conspiracy charge, and as long as they find one of those, one of those conspiracies, then the conspiracy is met. And it's so, the if, definition if we're of doing conspiracy. That, then so you're, the you're asking the jury to find the not is, only was it murder, or was it grand theft, or was it something else that the state was going to come up with between between now and the trial? Uh, and, and how do we punish that? Multiple crimes. You could intend no to problem. commit multiple crimes. Right. Right. That's the definition of conspiracy. Yeah. So what you can the ask you, the problem about? is, oh, we won't know if we simply ask you find guilty of conspiracy. No problem. Ask them the question more specifically. Do you find them guilty of conspiracy for murder? Do you find them guilty of conspiracy? If it's any one of them, just ask them every possible version of a question. You're there. And no it problem. literally it literally doesn't matter because they find if under the actual statute, if they find them guilty of conspiracy for anything that is a felony offense in the state of Idaho, then the statute is clear. That is conspiracy. Yep. We're done. Mm -hmm. if I don't. I don't care. And this is the split verdict problem when you deal with conspiracies. I don't need to ask them that question. If every jury juror finds them guilty of conspiracy to commit a felony, I don't care which one. Mm -hmm. Then we're done. Uh -huh. Yep, that satisfies the elements. That's of conspiracy. the argument he's yeah. making. Mm -hmm. And so now we have to go back to the jury and say, okay, so which conspiracy did you find? Well, we no, found that there was conspiracy no. to commit grand theft, but not conspiracy to commit murder. Or we found that there was conspiracy to commit murder, but not conspiracy to commit grand theft. Okay. And so now we're looking at, it just jumbles it up, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it that way. And we're bringing it before the court because we believe that we're, we're just looking for a fair trial. We just want the jury to be able to go back to the jury we'll room and say, yes, this is the conspiracy. The conspiracy is to commit murder. Or, yes, this is the conspiracy. The conspiracy is to commit grand theft. That's all we no, want. The conspiracy is That's to all we're looking for is a yes or no <laughs> uh, answer that the jury would, would need to come back with. Further in analysis would just be, I don't know. I don't know that it's appropriate, and I don't think it's fair for the jury to have to do that. Um, the state further takes uh, takes issue with my 8A uh, argument. Uh, 
they indicate that two or more offenses may be charged. I say that the two or more offenses may be charged on the same indictment. However, uh, Criminal Rule 8A indicates that those charges need to be separate counts. Um, and so the state's uh, attorney says that, that there's one conspiracy uh, for two, two different crimes, and, and I'm not analyzing that, and there's no analysis to that. Well, my analysis is, Judge, the state's wrong. The state needs to realize that, yeah, this needs to go back to the grand jury, and it needs to be conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to commit uh, grand theft. Um, the state goes on to make an untimely argument um, that we are untimely in our arguments. Uh, we would ask the court to, um, to rule on the merits of the case and not on the untimeliness. Um, the state has, in my opinion, the state has waived their right uh, to make this untimely argument. Um, we got their response to this, uh, to this motion just six days ago, which is, in, in my opinion, untimely. I think a seven-day notice is pretty standard around the state. Um, also, the state, um, you know, the court is aware of how much discovery is involved in this, uh, sorting through that, a, and perhaps, uh, I, I wouldn't even say that normal cases would, we would be able to find this uh, within the 28-day time frame that the legislature has led it as, as or that the rules have, have established. Uh, but this particular case, this case is, is far in excess of uh, the time frames and the uh, and and the process and the time needed to de to 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 just digest this case and the discovery, and the state uh, when I filed my discovery uh, motion, uh, I'm sorry, my discovery request on uh, April the 18th, uh, the state failed to respond in a timely manner. They responded timely, I guess I I should say that uh, on May the 2nd, which would have been the 14 days, but they responded by telling me, oh by the way, we'll get you your discovery within 14 days of May 2nd. So they were untimely on that, and yet they're telling me that, that I need to, uh, uh, you know, I, I was untimely on, on filing this motion and that I should have come to the court for re relief and request. Uh, I would also note that the docket indicates that uh, the court uh, didn't release the testimony of the grand jury uh, until June 21st, 2022, which that. is far beyond the time frame for us to file a 12, uh, 12B motion which I think is excusable error uh, based on the fact that we didn't have the information that we needed to dig into the indictment and dig into uh, the things that we needed to do. Your Honor, in closing, I would just uh, say to the court, and I know that the court is well aware of this, that a person's life is on the line. Uh, you know, the prosecutor for the state of Idaho uh, represents the interests of everybody in the state, and that includes the defendant. They are duty-bound to look out for the procedural interests of the defendant and what they're arguing, in my opinion, Your Honor, is wrong. Uh, the state's attorneys here uh, are here to seek justice, not just a win, and uh, they're here to protect the Constitution and the rights of all those in the state of Idaho, including those that they're prosecuting. And so I believe that the appropriate, uh, uh, the appropriate way to deal with this indictment is to return it to the grand jury and just have them split the two uh, conspiracy charges so that it's easier for a, for a regular jury, for a trial jury, to understand and to, uh, to sort through this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. I'll hear a response from the state. Mr. Wood, I'd like to start off with the issue raised there at the end that was raised in your uh, responses to both of these motions that they were failed to be filed timely under Criminal Rule 12B. And let's start there and then uh, move forward with the substance of this motion. Indeed. So if you'd like to present any argument at this time or notify the court if you're still uh, holding on to your objection on the timeliness issue. Thank you. Your Honor, we do maintain that objection. Uh, that's why I, we put it in our briefing. Uh, we do understand that 12B is a rule in which the court has a large amount of discretion uh, to find good cause or reasonable neglect. Uh, However, our, the reason why we filed that is in neither of the defendant's pleadings was any good cause or reasonable neglect provided for why these were untimely. I do take issue with the idea that the state was late in discovery. Uh, we had already provided all of the discovery to co-counsel, um, and so I, I take issue with that. Um, 
Yes, we do maintain that objection, understanding the court has wide discretion on that issue. Where's the argument on that? The court's reviewed that objection. It's made under uh, time frames that are set forth in Rule 12. Uh, in particular, Rule 12D of the Idaho Criminal Rules indicates motions under Rule 12B must be filed within 28 days after the entry of a plea of not guilty or seven days before trial, whichever is earlier. Uh, these are not within that time frame. However, that Rule 12D also has an important final sentence. The court may shorten or enlarge the time and for good cause shown or for excusable neglect may relieve a party of failure to comply with this rule. I've considered that objection and looked at the, uh, the objection as well as the discretion built within the rule under 12D. And I do find as it relates to both these motions that good cause has been shown for the timing of the motions. Uh, one is the complexity of the case and volume of discovery. There's been delays uh, through no fault of defense counsel with uh, their client having been uh, found incompetent for some time and then returned to competency for further proceedings. The court would note that trial is not scheduled in this matter until January, so we're still significantly before the time for trial. What is she the court would also about? note that we discussed specific dates for the calendaring of these motions along with the input from the state as to when these would be appropriate to be heard and uh, that rule goes to the filing of the motions, not necessarily the hearings, but uh, given that determination and my discretion, I think it's important that these issues be determined on the merits and not procedurally under the rule. And so in my Sharp discretion, judge. I am uh, finding good cause exists for a factual and legal determination on both of these motions today. And so I'll deny the objection as it relates to timeliness. Uh, finally, on that discovery issue raised, I don't take that into consideration at all because there's been no motion to compel filed or any other notice to the court that that's at issue. So with that ruling made, uh, Mr. Wood, if you would like to now present your response as to the merits of the motion on counts one and three. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I assure you, I'd be very happy that trial's not for another Going through the defense's uh, motion, uh, it's, it seems that they the, the primary concern is this, this is going to be confusing to a jury and, and unfair. Uh, I, the state just fundamentally disagrees. At the, um, the defense's argument rests on what appears to be a false premise that a conspiracy to commit multiple crimes is in fact multiple crimes. Uh, the, I've outlined this in my brief, so I don't want to go over it uh, word for word, but I just note that uh, multiple cases have held, and this is just a few of them, that the conspiracy is the crime, it's one crime, however diverse its objects. And that's very important language. You can have, you can have a conspiracy to commit uh, completely, completely different crimes. Uh, the state believes that in this case there are three conspiracies, there are three agreements. The, the conspiracy, the crime of the conspiracy is the agreement and an overt act uh, to further that agreement, whether that overt act is otherwise illegal or not. It doesn't have to be. Um, and so the, the state believes there are three ag criminal agreements. One was to murder Tylee Lyon and to steal the Social Security money that was uh, allotted to her. Brutal. One was to kill J.J. Vallow and to steal and continue to collect the uh, Social Security funds that were allotted to him. And those are the two counts that are at issue today. Uh, we, we do believe they are linked. Um, and so they, uh, they aren't completely separate. Uh, they, they are linked together, and we believe that the jury will find that there was this agreement, uh, that uh, they agreed to commit those two crimes. Um, when we talk about the elements... Let me ask you a question on that, Mr. Wood. Are, are you saying it's a single conspiracy that envelops counts one and three, or no. is count one a conspiracy and count three is a separate conspiracy? Yes. And I'm, I know I there's a third conspiracy charge in the indictment under count five. Right. I, I want to be very clear. We believe there are three separate conspiracies. Okay. Um, and so when, in looking through the defendant's pleadings and listening to argument today, they speak a lot about the elements. Well, the elements for the conspiracy, we don't have to prove the elements of the underlying crimes for a conspiracy. Um, 
I've listed the, what Kurt the jury was trying instructions to drop in the in in our briefing, and and the substantive showing that the state you, needs you to make and the jury needs to find on a reasonable doubt is that they agreed to commit a crime or crimes, and the jury instructions have this written right in. They have the S for crimes, a crime or crimes. Um, and that the defendant intended that at least one of those crimes would be committed and that one of the parties to the agreement performed at least one of the overt acts that are listed in the indictment. Those are the elements of the conspiracy, not whether or not the murder was completed. You don't even have to complete a crime Correct. for the conspiracy um, right. to, Correct. to be found. And so Let me I ask on another question on that, Mr. Wood. When you're instructing a jury, do they not have to be told what the underlying elements of a crime are. In other words, uh, the common lay person may well not know the difference between grand theft, Is burglary, and not robbery. Have so if you just throw in, for example, conspiracy? grand theft and say, was there a conspiracy to commit grand theft? Um, does the jury have to be told, well, here's what a grand theft is under Idaho law and lay out each of the elements so you make sure that they know what the underlying crime is that was part of the conspiracy? I believe so, but even if that's the case, they don't have to find the elements of the underlying crime. Um, for instance, if person A and person B agree to kill person C, they, they've made the agreement, that's the first part, and one of them purchases a gun and they drive there and then they get stopped before by the police, they've still completed the crime of conspiracy. Debatable, but uh, you're on the Because right the, cons the crime is the agreement and then taking an overt act in furtherance of it. It's not the completion. It's not, um, uh, it's not the completion of the crime. It's the crime is the agreement. And the case law on that is clear. You don't um, even speaking have, and have so the even impact. if the jury is entitled to see those elements, which they will in this case because they been charged with those separate crimes as well. Um, they don't have to find those elements. They don't have to find a single element of those crimes to find the crime of conspiracy. There, I, I found no case law to suggest that, that, that that's the case. And I don't believe there is any case law to suggest that because the crime is the agreement Can and you the overall. Um, in terms I of Mr. Thomas raised the issue of when does it end? Well, the yeah. Oh, I was just I was just wanted to point out why you don't have to prove the underlying elements of the conspiracy, because this this is one of the things that uh, cops will sometimes do in states that allow for what's called a unilateral conspiracy. Like if if they think that there's like a murder for hire, the cops will come to the attention that someone's trying to hire someone to kill someone else. Sometimes the cops will pose as a hitman, right? And so you'll, you'll sometimes even see this on like hidden dash cam tape on the on the sufficient shows, right? The cop gets into the car, they, they negotiate for the money. It's like five thousand dollars for the hit, blah blah blah, right? So you have the agreement for the conspiracy, right? And of course, the cop doesn't then go and try to kill the guy because he's not really doing that, right? And so then they then they arrest them for conspiracy. So like, yeah, it's like you don't have to the guy. You don't have to kill the guy. You don't even have to try to kill the guy. You just have to have the agreement to kill the guy and some sort of substantial step there, too. In the case of the cop, for example, that's usually the payment of the money, right? It's usually like, give me the $5,000 is the substantial step. And then once you give them the money, that's you have the agreement to you have the agreement to kill. Now you have to have a substantial step. OK, now I'm paying you. That's a substantial step towards the end of the conspiracy. And so you charge them with conspiracy. You can charge them with conspiracy for murder for hire. So no, yep. you don't have to prove the guy. You don't have to prove the murder for hire. The guy's still alive. <laughs> so I mean, so it happens it, every day. It's sort of interesting because um, the actual pattern jury instructions actually comports a little bit more with the defense's arguments as I'm reading it. Well, you might have to show that, the element. But you don't have to prove well, it. Well, no, they, but you have to identify the crime alleged to occur. Yeah, that 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 I understand. Like we have. So I, I think that that's one of the an defense's argument. objections is like which one. It's like okay, if your problem to me is which one, fine. I'll give the I'll give the jury charge as more segmented. So if your problem is I'm asking the jury, do you find conspiracy for any one of the following? And we're like, which one? No problem. I'll give more specific jury instructions. 
do you find conspiracy for this, for this, for this, for this, for this? Yep. I'll ask them 10 questions instead of one. Problem solved. But no, because the then, issue and, is... And you want to show the elements because... of that? It's like, in order to have murder for hire, they had to have an agreement that someone got paid and they wanted to kill the guy? I mean, and, yeah, okay. I'm trying to I'm trying to give a benefit of the doubt because I think that the defense is doing a terrible job, but benefit of the doubt argument would be why not just charge one conspiracy of the entire circumstance and mm -hmm. potentially that's beneficial on the back end i i think that's what they're sort of trying to argue it you don't want that sort of split verdict problem which is already not a problem because the actual statute is you just have to yeah be in conspiracy for a felony um but the way that they actually did the pattern jury instructions is a little weird to me yeah if it's that much, if it's that much a problem to you, defense is like we're not sure which. Fine, I'll give them ten instructions. Yeah, the, the, issue, the issue that I, the issue that I have is that the pattern jury instructions per charge actually say you have to define the crime by which they are in conspiracy. Sure. So yeah, that I actually does, I think, go to the defense versus, argument. I have to define murder for hire versus. Uh, arson versus burglary versus whatever my conspiracy is sure no but i i think basically what they're doing here is they're arguing because there are multiple issues the insurance fraud the theft of stuff all of that all of those are felonies and so should that not be conglomerated for the sake of the defendant into one criminal act for the conspiracy purposes well, Which, if, that, yeah, that's a that's a fair point. If I'm saying, if what I'm charging them for is one conspiracy, and I can find conspiracy for any of these reasons, then when it ultimately comes to sentencing, then I don't care. I don't care how many of you, how many of them you find, right? If there are ten of them, hypothetically, if I find one, great. If I find ten, great. Either way, though, I'm only sentencing you to one count of conspiracy, because that's the way you charged it. So if the, if, the, if, the, if the sentence is 14 years, then whether you find one or 10, it's still 14 years because it's ultimately one count. It can just be for any of these reasons. <clears throat> That's fine. Right. I and and I, th I think the argument that they're, that the defense is trying to make is that they charge three counts of conspiracy. And because this is one continuous course of conduct, that's not appropriate. If I were to rephrase how he said it, he said it very poorly, in my personal opinion, but that, I think, well, is the argument they were trying to make. They could be segmented conspiracies. I mean, you could have... <clears> it, it, I mean, it's not inherently obvious if you have three distinct crimes, whether or not they're... Oh, I, I, I don't know if they can not. win the argument. I just think that was yeah. the argument he was trying to make and didn't... Yeah. So I mean, but, but to what end? The jury question, right, is if I, if, I, if, I, if I conspire with you to murder person A, murder person B, murder person C, is that one big conspiracy or three separate conspiracies? Well, that sounds like a question of fact to me. Mm -hmm. So go ask a jury about it. That's what they're for. Yeah, I, and, I'm playing devil's advocate. And, maybe and does, it, does it help the defendant's cause if they say, okay, you have a conspiracy for, for a grand theft. You have a conspiracy for fraud. You have a conspiracy for murder. Does that help? I mean, you could just rack up more charges. Yeah. You want to make it three bit you want to make it three different conspiracies instead of one big conspiracy? So now I got three I, distinct conspiracies, so that's three distinct counts. I, I literally way? don't see where this do helps. Too. Because the minimum potentially is 14 years. Uh-huh. And if you can get 14 years to run if you can get 14 years to run concurrently, maybe it doesn't make a difference. But if the issue is if you're dealing with three 14 year consecutive sentences, she's dead. Mm. Eh, she might make it. Could be Even if you beat the rest. Roll. But but you know what I mean? Like there there is there is a logic to what they're trying to do. Sure. I just don't think they're doing sure. it that effectively. Well, let's see. And of the course, court pointed out there can be I ongoing conspiracies. And we do believe that the evidence here is going to show that it ended when Social Security stopped paying out the money that was being stolen. Um, and we believe, uh, and so 
it doesn't, the conspiracy doesn't necessarily end when one of the crimes is completed. If there's multiple crimes, it ends when the whole conspiracy ends. Uh, and I, I, I don't think that's confusing. I don't think a jury's going to find that confusing. Um, and so I, again, Your Honor, I go back to this, to the point that um, uh, the law isn't unfair because it's bad for the defendant. That doesn't mean it's unfair. The law is not unfair uh, because it's not in the defendant's favor. Uh, no crime is in the defendant's favor. And so, uh, I, so I, I take issue with that agreement that this is fundamentally unfair. I don't believe this is fundamentally unfair. I think these are charges based on the evidence provided to the grand jury. Uh, they didn't have a problem with it. Uh, they found it. And so if they can find it, I think it, uh, we can put it in front of the, 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 the pettit jury, the, the trial jury. Um, Mr. Wood, I do, I do have a few more questions on that. And I'll sure. just let you know, I've, before the motion was filed, I've looked at these two counts a lot of times because I, I do, I have not determined whether or not they're correct or incorrect, but I will say I haven't seen charges that uh, had multiple crimes that were unrelated like that in a single count and thinking in terms of going forward my concerns have, have been two number one uh, how do you instruct a jury with a jury instruction um, and maybe we'd start there do you believe a jury instruction would require a definition of all elements of both offenses if you're going to tell a jury they conspired to commit these two crimes the way the indictment is written it's in the conjunctive using the word and conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft so that tells me the jury's got to find both of them not one or the other is the way it's written and so well, do you think good. within a jury instruction you've got to say and here's what a first degree murder is and here's what a grand theft is and is that all part of now we're getting to a very, I can see a very large and cumbersome jury verdict form or uh, instruction on how do you find count one. I have seen no case law or authority that says we have to provide the elements of the underlying crime to the jury. If it's out there, then, then it's out there. But I've seen, in my research on this issue, I've never seen any authority that states we have to do that. And I think the rationale behind that is those underlying crimes are not the crime. They're already being charged with the murder and the grand theft separately. At least Mrs. Daybell is charged with the grand theft separately. Uh, and so the jury will have those elements already anyway in this case. So if that is a concern for the court, I think it's already taken care of because the jury is going to see the elements of those crimes when they have to decide on the murder charges and the grand theft charges. Um, I actually think that we are confusing the issue if you start giving the elements of the underlying crimes in a conspiracy instruction because the conspiracy is the crime, the agreement is the crime. Uh, we've been given the jury instructions uh, from the Supreme Court and nothing in there says anything about the uh, listing out the elements of the underlying crimes. Okay, and I appreciate your response. And the yeah, next definitely. issue I had is back to what Just Mr. Right Thomas question. brought up also under the uh, statute that sets out the punishment for conspiracy. Uh, it's whatever the punishment is, as it states, for the crime or offenses they combine to commit. So if there were a guilty verdict returned on count one and or count three, uh, what do you believe is the statutory uh, required maximum penalties for that offense where you've got one offense that's only a 14-year maximum, one is up to life in prison or death? Uh, do you pick the higher one? Do you pick the lower one? Does it matter? Do you pick both? Could they run consecutive? Um, those are questions I have also with these two separate different offenses and going to uh, what, what would a punishment be then if you got there? You know, I, I think, shockingly, I guess I don't think it's that confusing. I think they're punishable by the underlying sentences, so up, they, they can't. 
But it's the same. It, the conspiracy. This is a conspiracy either way. I think it's the same sentencing. The issue is: is it one grand conspiracy, or is it three separate conspiracies? Right. And so, and that's what the judge is, I think, trying to get at: is it one grand conspiracy, and is it appropriate for the state to go three bites at the apple kind of a situation? If it's one grand conspiracy, yeah, but then you still have to ask him which which it is because if if what you do is mirror which i believe is what he said earlier if you mirror the penalty for the underlying charge then you need to know which it is so that you can you know mirror the underlying charge so if it's one big conspiracy and you have three different things you would not need to ask the jury each of those three separate questions because you need to be able to mirror them accordingly well that's what makes it a little bit of a mess is because there are three underlying felonies and i don't think this would see the light of day and you know I'm not going to give my opinions on death, but if you're arguing fairness, is it okay to charge it three times? And even if in the sentencing phase, you deal with the lowest possible punishment, is doing that three times potentially consecutively what the legislature intended? I'm not sure, and I don't think this judge is sure either. I think you could only mirror the highest that you find. I think you'd have to. I think you'd have to list them separately, and then you would then you would give the one that's the highest, because they're all part of one big conspiracy. That's the only way it makes sense. Well, then why charge it three times? Well, because they don't all carry the same penalties. Uh, there's what they do. two different two different murders and a grand theft thing, right? That's what it's, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. So I don't the, know if the, the, murder, the, the murders sentencing carry changes life is, imprisonment. The murders carry life imprisonment. I'm not sure what the grand theft carries. So you would need to know whether or not they find the murders the, or the grand theft. But does the, the, the sentence mirroring. for conspiracy change? Not. Not. You see what I'm saying? That was my understanding. They did. My understanding was that conspiracy mirrors the underlying charge. Okay. He so seems what, to suggest what, that what the conspiracy the mirrors the charge. Can, can they recharge it? At this point, I mean that, that. I mean, I don't know. I don't do criminal stuff, but like, no, I don't think they he, can. I think they're bound by whatever charging document they came out of the grand jury with. I mean, they'd have to go back to the grand jury and, and re. I mean, you could always, you could always indict as long as That's you're within the statute of limitations. Well, so murder maybe, doesn't have statute of limitations. That's not a real problem. No. I'm sure. Well, the but the, of that's what I'm saying. Is crap. Maybe the answer just at the end of the day is go back and get a cleaner indictment. Maybe. Oh, this this thing might not be going to trial. Oh, who knows? I thought there there, I thought the written argument was really creative murder. on it. And I, I think that's well established. And I think in this specific case, if the jury is to find them guilty here, uh, the ultimate punishment for that is is the death penalty. Um, and I think when you you just look at it in a common sense approach that lower sentence is swallowed up in the higher sentence anyway and so i, I don't find that to be an issue i think uh, i think the the statute is clear i think the statute even i mean it uses the uh it uses the plural with the word offenses as well so i think it already contemplates that i think whatever the higher one is is the one that controls yep okay, okay. Right. i appreciate your response on that question right. as well i don't like that answer any other questions? That's, that's the only questions I have at this okay. point. I would just end again, Your Honor. Uh, this is not. Um, we disagree that this is confusing. Um, and uh, without going into uh, the the grand jury proceedings, the grand jury didn't have a problem with it. I don't think a a jury will uh, a trial jury will have a problem with it. Because again, if you really break it down to what the crime is, it's not that confusing. The crime is that they agreed to murder someone and steal money linked to that person. And the crime is the agreement and an overt act. Um, and as long as we establish that, um, then the jury can make the finding either guilty or not guilty. Um, and I think when we start talking about introducing all the other elements, I don't know that there's any legal rationale or authority that provides for that. Again, I haven't found any. Uh, upon receiving, I would note that the defense hasn't given any authority for that. Um, and when I, when I received their brief and did, we researched this before 
we ever put this in front of a grand jury, research this issue, and then when we received their brief, we went back and researched again. I haven't found any authority that says that's the case, that we need to do that. Um, and so, uh, based on that, we would ask the court to deny the motion. Um, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Thomas, would you like to present any rebuttal argument? Just a few points, Judge. I'm a little bit concerned that, uh, that the state is indicating is that they researched this issue prior to presenting it to the grand jury. So I've never done a grand jury. Okay, I was a prosecutor for, for a few years uh, in Bingham County, but I never did a grand jury. And so I'm not really familiar, and as are most attorneys, not really familiar with the process of the grand jury. But my understanding of a grand jury is that you present them with evidence, uh, they go back, they deliberate, they decide what they want to charge it with, and then they come back to the prosecutor and say, these are the charges we're willing to, to, to commit, uh, to indict this person on. What Mr. Wood is intimating, I think, is that they decided what the charges were going to be, they presented the document to the grand jury, and asked the grand jury to just sign off on it. And so, I, I'm not sure that that's appropriate. I'm not sure that that's the way it should be, and I don't know, and I probably will never know, because uh, the grand jury deliberations are secret, and I'm not privy to those uh, to those deliberations. This guy was a prosecutor. Uh, but that's one thing that I, I kind of raised concerns yeah. with me uh, is that perhaps this grand jury was led down a path that they weren't prepared to sign off on. If I'm confused, if the court is In confused, school, I counts one things. and counts three, I I I don't know yeah. what the grand jury would think. I'm assuming that they too may be. At least one or two of them may have been confused. Okay, this is careful. making me, me nuts. The grand jury is secret. You can't do anything with it. You're not going anywhere, and you don't have a motion pending on that. You can't just sit there and throw mud at a grand jury at this point. If you wanted to make that argument, file a motion. Now, every, everything about how he is handled, he has no <laughs> understanding of how criminal process works. I, As I said... As a law school exercise, I wrote proposed indictments, and you just give it right. to the grand jury, and they would say yes or no. Yeah, yeah right, right, right. Be argued, you, you, that's you the way it's done. It. He d he does do a good unfrozen caveman lawyer, though. He's like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how this grand jury works, like, no, but I'm sure it was wrong. <laughs> oh my god, it's like it's like listening to people, and I'm not to get into the Trump thing. They're like, oh, well, we got the search warrant. It's like, yeah, but we don't have the probable cause affidavit, so it doesn't mean anything. Right. Yeah. It's like it's just basic process stuff. I, frustrating. That I'll leave it at that. <laughs> the second thing I have <laughs> is that, you know, the but state right. is relying upon uh, this Fowork versus United States, a 1919 case, where it indicates, and they, they quote it, the conspiracy is the crime and that is one, however diverse its objects. Um, when you read the actual opinion, um, it's a very short six-page opinion, uh, well-written, but you can tell that it's very political. It's a very political opinion regarding the war uh, that, we, that we were about to go into, and, and there were issues there. And so I think that the language that they took out of there, um, perhaps not taken out of context, but we need to look at it in, in in what the surrounding circumstances were at the time. I mean, we were about to go to war. What? The person that uh, that they were uh, filing this charge against uh, was the person that uh, owned a newspaper in, in uh, Missouri, and he was writing things that were uh, that that were bad for the war effort. And the Supreme Court of the United States, I think, latched onto that. And so, I think we should take that case and Are that you talking about uh, the Alien Sedition Act? Uh, citation that they're heavily relying upon with a grain of salt, or at least I would ask the court to review that case, and I'm sure it will. I'm sure it had that all in mind, and maybe it has already, but I would just, uh, uh, I, I lay concern upon that, upon the state relying upon that particular case and upon that particular um, uh, uh, statement in that case. It'd be helpful if you cited uh, it. Relying so heavily upon that. <laughs> Other than that, Your Honor, I have no, no objections, or no, I have nothing to that, you know, Okay, that case, thanks John. for the argument, Mr. <laughs> Thomas. Yeah, that one. So, uh, in this particular motion, then the court will you also take that matter under advisement, do some additional research and review your briefings, and consider the arguments presented here today. The court will issue a written decision on the second motion as well.
So I believe well, I that gavel. concludes the proceedings the for this morning. Uh, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Archibald, is there anything further from the defense today? <coughs> this is kind of weird. They we walk her a, out specifically. Matters Forest. take up with the court under seal. We don't have anything more in public. Okay, we'll take that up after. Oh, and Mr. Steel. Wood, That's anything nice. further today from the state? No, thank you. All right. If everyone will give me just a brief moment, I want to consult with the bailiff, and then we'll conclude the hearing. I, I mean, this must be high profile because the the way they're the way they're handling this procedure. It's incredibly <coughs> high profile, insanely high profile. The the uh, the Daybell valid case is huge. In All right. At this time, it's if everyone can remain seated, we're going to have uh, the defendant taken from the courtroom along with uh, counsel can go with her if you'd like and then we'll yeah. conclude the hearing so once that's complete i'll advise the audience when you're allowed to get up and leave uh, so we can go ahead and go off the record at this point and i appreciate everyone's uh, consideration of the court rules today and the way you've conducted yourself and this hearing's concluded all right goodbye bye laurie go back to prison no one likes me <laughs> Right. Back to the claim quick I don't even know where to begin. Uncivil is my favorite man on a bus. That's nice. Thanks. <laughs> no, how do we do this? There we go. Well, thank you guys. I saw that hearing today and I literally am like, I know this is happening and I, I'll blow it off if it's later. I don't really know the case, but, you know, nothing better than just diving in and watching. Well, yeah, and it, there's interesting because there's been a motion filed by a, uh, a retired attorney because a lot of the stuff that's in this case has been under seal because the defense mm -hmm. hasn't objected. Uh, so a, lot, a, half, a good half of the material that there would otherwise be in a case like this has been under seal. And so uh, a retired attorney who's apparently been contracted to write a book about Daybell has written a motion, and it's well written, um, to basically try to unseal a whole bunch of documents in the public interest. So we'll see how that works. Ooh. And either way, I'm covering this case uh, gavel to gavel when this thing pops in January. Because I don't care about the trial. a huge thing in true crime. And, and I, think, um, I think that what there's a really interesting question about what actually happens at trial in reality because mm -hmm. this case is so complex factually that i think the jury the the prosecutor could screw it up or the jury could get lost or a whole bunch of things could happen and who god knows what people are actually going to testify to so i think uh the this is the sort of i, I at least in my own head i tend to write in my own head like how trials are going to happen and i'm usually mm -hmm. you know in the ballpark of close and here I don't feel like I have a good I don't feel like I have a good conception of what's gonna happen. So yep. I feel like I'm gonna be surprised. Do we uh, Kurt, do you happen to know how long they requested for the trial? I think it's now scheduled for six weeks. They originally had asked for twelve. Okay. But I think it's there are, for like weeks. you said, there I was trying to figure out the moving parts and it yeah. you know, in a very short period before I hop it on here. It's it's just a nightmare. That's why yeah. I don't. I mean, I just don't know the facts at all. But like, for instance, I I, I always like to. I mean, it's hard because you're talking about multiple trials. But I mean, if like, let's say you have the goods on the murder, let's just do that, and not confuse the jury with with well, the, the conspiracies that, I mean, the, and this and that's that. That's what the, the prosecutor should try to do. I mean, the pros uh, the prosecutor, as, as I was talking about this with Scott Rush, and he was correct. Prosecutor should try to keep it simple, like. Okay, the child they had children. The children are dead. They they the children were not seen while they were getting married in Hawaii because they were already dead, buried in a backyard. Let's talk about that. And the defense has incentives to conflate the issues because we have to break up the cork board. Yep. It's always sunny in Philadelphia style to figure out what's going on. Um, but I I think there's you know the prosecutor. This is a small shop. It's rural Idaho. I think they've got mm -hmm. two people, you know, in ha in their in their prosecution shop. And yep. the there is I figure there's a very strong probability. I think because the prosecutor seems a little bit flustered at times, they seem a little bit off point, ill prepared at times. I think there's a decent probability 
they might screw it up. So we'll find out. Well, yeah, and one of the problems is if you, if you go with a single charge, which is why I keep thinking with these conspiracy things, if you go with a single charge, especially if you split these things up and try them separately, you, you end up with empty chair defenses. So he sits there and says, no, she did it. And then and then he gets and he gets off and then she goes to trial and says, nope, the jury screwed up. He did it. Mm-hmm. And that's and that is when I see the pleading, that's the first thing I think of. I could be wrong, but that's just that's just my gut. What I think. Yeah, that, it, I don't think it's was, too much of a stretch to say they're in a conspiracy to, to murder the kids found in his backyard, which, you know, of all the places to bury them seems like the not the greatest choice in Idaho, which, you know, has some trees and forests. Yeah. I, I, it seems like we could have picked any a number of better places, but okay. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I, you know. I I tend to agree, but it is just genuinely, on some level, frustrating to see. I actually prefer Mike's approach, where break it up on a factual basis, because it is, and I see the defense side's argument that it could be confusing which charge is based upon which factual grounds, and that can be a problem, and that can be, honestly, a due process concern. And the last thing you want to do is open up potentially a point of appeal. Um, mm-hmm. but Or just charge the conspiracy and the most obvious thing is the prosecutor. For instance, like if you have the goods on, say, insurance fraud, like you just have the documents locked and loaded, just get them. Just 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 do it that don't even go conspiracy for murder. Charge them with murder, but but don't even try the conspiracy for murder. I mean, the the, the conspiracy for the fraud is, is, of course, contingent on them being dead. Yeah. So the murder is the thing. Like, do you really? Yeah. You could you could just you could just charge the murder and just the conspiracy for the murder and keep it relatively simple instead of these backup charges. But I mean, it's prosecutorial decision on how to go. But as I pointed out, uh, Vala Lori Vala is also wanted in Arizona for murder uh, for her other husband, I think. Yeah, my chat, my chat's telling me that yeah, that she she murdered her ex or whatever. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. There's a little saying. bit of murder of the ex. New Mexico's looking into her. Uh, there's been attempted assassinations and all the rest of it. It's uh, it's a complicated nightmare. These even if even if Lori Vallow somehow manages to escape liability in Idaho, you know her her legal woes are nowhere near over. So she's going down eventually. It's well, thank you, thank you for coming on and and providing background because I didn't know. I did just dive in there. I was hoping you would you would come help me out. John certainly came and helped out. Yeah. But you know what? My my thought is, and I'm not a criminal defense attorney, but but I, I I get into this. It's not altogether shocking, but I feel like I know less than I started. Right? Not, not that I know less. I know more, but it, I'm more confused than when I started. How's that? I feel that way basically every time I cover this case. So you're in good company. <laughs> that, that's a feeling that doesn't go away. It hasn't gone away for me yet. I'm I I can't I can't say to you I have it crystallized in my mind. You know, I have I have it in my mind. I have it. I may not be able to explain it to you, but at least I've got it. I don't got yeah. it, Mike. I don't like got once it. we got into, I didn't know. For instance, when we got into uh, when we got into Depp Heard, uh-huh. I didn't know what was going on. But I'll tell you what, we said we got in there and started seeing some witnesses. But about a day in, you're like, okay, I get the lay of the land. I I understand all the theories and everything that's going on. Be interesting to see how the evidence comes in. Yeah, but there's nothing confusing about what's going on here. Well, a lot's going to depend on the opening. That'll give us a clue. Hopefully, the or the, the opening hopefully will tell us the story we're going to hear, and maybe the prosecution will go with the keep it simple, stupid philosophy, which yeah. is probably the right way to go. And you know, give a 30, 45 okay. minute opening. Keep it simple. I'm inter- no, no, I, I'm inter- I am interested if this thing goes to trial. That will be good. But but somewhere along the way, I need I need I need more Chad Daybell dramatic readings. I'm just saying. Well, we could uh, we could purchase his books on Amazon. He self published, and we could we could just flip to random pages. It could be our own our daily umbrella random pages from Chad well, Gabel's or, masterworks. You, you know what you should do is you should you should um you should just put a bunch in the can. Like you should just just one night just like read a bunch of this. And then, and then, like during the trial, you know, when the when the jury's out, or they're waiting for him to come back for lunch or something. Like you could just go to it. I think that would be fantastic. 
Oh yeah, no, that'd be great. No, I, I, I will definitely buy some of his books. And during breaks, <laughs> we'll we'll, re- we'll break out random portions of the post-apocalyptic Mormon uh, end of days fiction. Oh, you know, it got spicy! It got spicy with the, with the feelings and the uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> All right, thanks for coming out. I really appreciate. It. Thank you to John too, but he just whatever he he just came off. But that but that was a ton of fun. I'm sure I'm sure we'll be doing more on this. I'll I'll, I'll jump on your channel when you're doing it, uh, and and we'll have fun. January, pencil it in, man. I'm gonna need the company. All right, sounds good. Bye. Bye.